order. You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man. And to lose one chairman could be conceived or perceived as unfortunate. To lose two begins to look a lot like carelessness. To lose three, of course, cites the possibility of conspiracies playing a role in the process. And thank goodness they haven't yet lost the fourth. They did, however, see the suspension last night of the most senior lawyer employed by the inquiry into historical child sexual abuse. And so it would seem the mess continues. This suspension follows claims of a clash over the scope of the inquiry. And my confidence in using the word mess is confirmed by the fact he only discovered his suspension from the media. How do we have this conversation, guys? How, how do we do this? I don't know if you're relatively new to the programme or whether you listened um, over the last couple of years as we did our very best to stay across these issues. It was, a, it was a mission rendered all the more difficult and indeed a hope rendered all the more forlorn by the fact that one of the key witnesses in some elements of these investigations turned out to be untrustworthy, that character Nick whose uh, 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 situation is desperately unfortunate, but whose impact upon the wider questions of credibility and culpability is well, its almost incalculable. I just remind you, however, of all the things that have nothing to do with that guy that this inquiry was supposed to be looking at. The Roman Catholic Church, the abbot of my old school, got arrested a couple of months ago. There was another story in, on the front of the Times involving a uh, former teacher at my old big school. It was a teacher at my prep school who first, what would the word be, provoked my interest in these issues of historical child sexual abuse. But my big school, my public school, has had all sorts of problems as well. The Anglican Church, similarly, it's looking there at the extent of institutional failures to protect children from abuse. It's not confined to Christianity, although in the context of historical child sexual abuse, the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church will be at the top of the list. There's a story in the newspapers today about an imam whose bosses sent him off to India after he was accused of raping a little, an 11-year-old boy in the lavatories at the mosque where he worked. So religious leaders, clerics, have always been overrepresented in the catalogue of crimes of this nature committed against children. You've got the residential schools, Nottinghamshire Council in particular, Lambeth Council. Lord Janner, you see, fascinating example of this whole process. He is mentioned in Jeremy Paxman's new autobiography of all places, and it's one of those lines that, that, that makes me wonder whether we're supposed to read between the lines when Paxman writes about how most people in the green room at Newsnight would be good value and, and, and good company, but occasionally you'd get egregious show-offs, and he writes that Jana would always turn up with a small cadre of young people who he was desperately trying to impress, make of that what you will. Similar stories, of course, involve his um, visits to LBC Radio uh, back in the day, decades ago, when he would turn up here with young people he was apparently desperate to impress. So he's been looked at. We're looking at the protection of children outside the UK. We're looking at the sexual abuse of children in custodial institutions. So Medamsley Youth Detention Centre in County Durham was going to be the first case study. Then you've got the organised networks. That's going to look at the institutional responses to the systematic grooming and sexual abuse of children by groups of offenders in places like Rotherham, Rochdale, Oxford, uh, Cambridge House, Knoll View, Rochdale. I, I mean, there, there is almost no corner of the country that would have been untouched by this inquiry and yet they haven't taken any evidence yet. I know the wheels of the law move slowly, and I know that the uh, cases before them are incredibly complicated and difficult to police properly, but millions of pounds have been spent. The fourth chairman is in place. The senior lawyer who was reported yesterday to be considering quitting has been suspended, and no evidence has been heard. The last chair to quit, Dame Lal Goddard, who went back to New Zealand a couple of months ago, had indeed criticised the inherent problem in the sheer scale and size of the inquiry, almost as though they felt she felt that the, perhaps the inquiry had bitten off more than it could hopefully hope to chew. And that's where I don't know what to say to you, because we spoke about stuff like this at great length. We, we spoke to 
people whose stories will stay with us, you and me both, forever. And we know, we, we know, you and I know, there are still, of course, some people out there who are sceptical, some for slightly weird, callous and, and sinister reasons, some for perfectly ordinary reasons about why so much effort is put in to these investigations. We know because we see what it does to a former victim. I, I know one quite well, um, and he was the reason why I got so heavily involved in covering these stories when other corners of the media didn't want to. And you know why they didn't want to. I promise you, um, why I know why they didn't want to. It, it, it happened to me. One of the very first times we did it, I don't know if you were listening, and a gentleman rang in to talk to me about the abuse he'd suffered as a child, and I felt myself flinching first and then turning away second. It's probably, actually, it's probably rating suicide in terms of, of, of radio listening figures, but I, I think we have a responsibility not to look away. And I said to this um, gentleman who was describing what had happened to him as a child, I told him the truth. I said, that was, that was, I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you that I, I wanted you to stop. I, ne I nearly cut in. And that's what the country's done now for decades. When somebody starts telling us about what's happened to them, we go, whoa, no, 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 no. Oh, look, I really feel sorry for you. And I know that it's awful, but I don't want to talk about this because it makes me feel really, really uncomfortable. And that's what's happened on a national scale. And it looked, didn't it, about 18 months ago as if we were finally going to turn that light on and leave it shining, leave it shining. <sighs> And now the most senior lawyer has been suspended after rumours that he was going to quit and we already knew we were on to our fourth chairman since July the 7th, 2014. So barely two years. Supposed to be one of the great home office legacies of our new Prime Minister, Theresa May, who is increasingly beginning to look like a politician who, who doesn't actually deliver, makes all the right noises at the right times, but as time passes, so the possibility of a meaningful action diminishes. The problem I've got now is that loads of you told me, loads of you told me that this would happen. And a lot of survivors told me that this would happen. One thing I'll say again, because it's been a while since we turned our attention to this territory, is that if, if you have a problem with the language that I use, just tell me and I'll fix it, all right? This is one of those areas where sometimes we, we, we stumble into the wrong terminology. So, for example, the distinction between historic and historical seems pertinent. Um, the newspapers all say historic, but that, that's like a historic victory. Historical means it happened a long time ago. I even prefer unsolved, actually, to historical, because historical almost puts it on a different category to a crime that was committed yesterday when the scars and the echoes of crimes like these continue for the rest of your life, your entire life, and, and sometimes beyond your own life, because it will affect the trust that you have for other people, it will affect the quality of relationships that you can form, the emotional literacy that you develop, all of that can affect the generation after, and after that can affect your children, your grandchildren, it affects everybody, and it never goes away, and that's why, I'll tell you this, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing it a bit backwards this morning, but it's not exactly a normal conversation, is it? And I, the, 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 there's a lad I know who's just changed so much since they jailed the bar steward who abused him. He's changed so much. It's, it's, it's almost unbelievable to see. Like my old mate from when I was 12 just disappeared the year after I left prep school and I never saw him again. Every time I saw him, he was, he was just a, I mean, he was grumpy, like a lot of teenage boys are. And he was un, he, he'd lost the ability, he didn't enjoy the stuff that we used to enjoy together. We, we, we didn't become enemies as such, but whenever our paths crossed subsequently, it was as if the, the fun times that we'd shared as children had gone, you know? We would dig dens together and, and, and play cricket all day. You remember that when you'd play cricket? Like literally from, from, from dawn till dusk. And one of you would be pretending to be Ian Botham and the other one was pretending to be Bob Willis and you'd be on 614 not out when your mum made you come in for your tea and all that kind of thing. And then, you know when you just know something's changed inside someone and you just don't know what it is? You just don't know what it is. You think it's you. You think, okay, maybe, maybe he just doesn't like me anymore. It's perfectly normal. Well, maybe not perfectly normal, but it's, 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 it's plausible. And, and then I found out. I found out he, his name was on the list of the lads at my old school. And I've and I, I, I seen him since. He's, he, I promise you, it's as if someone has flicked a switch. 30 bloody years it's taken. And someone's flicked a switch back on. And he smiles back. And the light's back in his eyes. And that's why these inquiries are so important. And it's why I don't really understand what's going on with this one. 
I want to believe it's incompetence. 0345 6060 973. I want to believe it's bad luck. 0345 6060 973. But right now, I can't. Because of all the men and women who queued up to tell me that they believe that the corridors of power in this country have historically contained some disgusting individuals who have done disgusting things to entirely innocent and blameless children. And that because those corridors were so well populated and those echelons of society were so high, these men, these women, these, these broken children just couldn't believe they'd ever get justice. And today with a heart that I think you can tell from my voice is so heavy, I'm wondering whether they were right, whether this is gonna fall apart like a cheap suit and the children who just want justice. That's what it is. The word here is trust. If, as a child, you have that most important of bonds broken so completely, you lose the ability to trust on a scale that the rest of us can never truly understand. We can only empathize, and seek to understand, but to know that you can't trust, especially if a parent was involved, or a priest, or a figure of authority, which it almost always is, you never get fixed until you get believed. And when you get believed, someone gets the blame. And when someone gets the blame, you can stop blaming yourself. That's my clumsy understanding of the issue, having spoken to far more people than I would ever have wanted to about some of the attendant concerns here. 03456060973 is the number you need. Just tell me where you are now. If you've been involved in this, I know a lot of my listeners, or, or rather I know a lot of the people who are involved in this, start sort of sending each other messages at about two minutes after 10 in the morning to say James is, James is tackling it again, James is doing it. So if you're one of those people and you do have a link to the inquiry, uh, you do have a, a, a proverbial dog in the race, you tell me what's going on. There were so many elements, 13 different investigations all pulled together under one umbrella. If you're a lawyer, tell me whether you think that was unfeasible from the start, because if it was, Theresa May's got questions to answer, hasn't she? She might not be Home Secretary anymore, but this is her, this is her creation. Amber Rudd has merely inherited it, and she said last night, as she defended the inquiry and its scale, said the terms of reference set up originally were the right ones. How do ordinary Joes and Josephines like you and me know whether or not the terms of inquiry set up on something like this were the right ones? I don't know. I don't know. You're going to have to help me out here. Because I haven't got a, a, a binary question or a black and white issue to, to hit you over the head with. I, I just want to know, A, what you think is going on. Okay? 03456060973. And B, because we don't allow people in this position to speak as often as perhaps we should. Do you believe, somebody who may be close to this sort of story, do you believe that actually the truth will never come out because it would involve people too prominent, too powerful and too, well, influential? 16 minutes after 10 is the time. An awful lot of fuss was made by the mainstream media. I hate that phrase. I'm never entirely sure what it means because I'm part of it that Leon Britton's last days were polluted by uh, an investigation into one allegation against him, almost as if all the other allegations against him had never been made or properly explored. Uh, and the convenience, of course, of, of Greville Janner's dementia remains something questionable. I want you to tell me today whether or not actually, for once, the conspiracy theories might be right and the truth might never out. You can email me, james at lbc.co.uk. You can text 84850 or, or you can call me and I'll take a call from almost any angle today because no one else will be talking about this today in the way that we do for the reasons I've told you. It's too ugly. It's too too unpleasant. It's too scary. 0345 6060 is the number you need. It's 1017. And there's a, there's a sort of reluctance in, in my position on this particular issue this morning. A, because I don't want it to be true, and B, because usually all of these conspiracy theories aren't true. So we're not doing the moon landings or the Twin Towers. We're doing VIP, non-recent child sexual abuse. And the latest collapse of this inquiry, the latest wobble, the latest, I don't know what word you want to use, adds so much fuel to the fire of suspicion that there is, there is a genuine and, and concerted attempt to stop the truth from coming out. Its most senior lawyer has been suspended. Hours later, news that another leading counsel had resigned. 
All this at the inquiry set up to get to the truth of widespread child abuse allegations across the country's public institutions. An inquiry which has already lost three chairpersons. Victims say it's devastating. So what does this mean for the future of this multi-million pound two-year-long investigation? Here's our senior Home Affairs correspondent, Simon Israel. Britain's largest ever public inquiry has yet again lurched into crisis. Its chief lawyer, Ben Abbasson QC, is now suspended. Under investigation, for what and for how long, has not been disclosed, least of all, apparently, to him. Some survivors' groups describe it as a catastrophe. It's devastating. And I will say this, when they had the investigation into Lambeth many years ago, when that failed, people committed suicide. This is how serious this is, and I, I just don't get that people are taking this seriously enough, that you're leading people to believe they're going to get justice. They're going back through their backstory, reliving the nightmares again, just to watch this farce. Awful. Ben Emerson's been described as a Goliath in the area of human rights. His CV certainly reflects that. A United Nations Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism, a British judge at the International Criminal Court, he defeated the UK government over detention without trial and defeated the MOD over discrimination against homosexuals in the armed forces. So will the child abuse inquiry lose teeth if his suspension becomes dismissal? I just hope that if, God forbid, that is to happen, that a replacement is found. This inquiry is by no means just about one person or a handful of people. It's a massive undertaking. This evening, things got even worse when it emerged that another of the inquiry's lawyers, Elizabeth Prochaska, a colleague of Mr Emerson's, had quit. And amid this turmoil, an inquiry statement attempted to reassure all those it was set up to help. We are aware that recent events are unsettling, particularly for victims and survivors of child sexual abuse and all those who are engaged with the inquiry's work. It has been said that the inquiry is in crisis. This is simply not the case. After two years, the inquiry has yet to hear evidence in any of its 13 separate investigations into failing institutions, ranging from churches to councils to government itself. In that time, though, it's lost three chairwomen and now possibly its most senior lawyer. But the one thing that has remained are the inquiry's ambitious terms of reference. When those terms of reference were set, they were agreed with victims and survivors. And it's victims and survivors who are at the heart of this inquiry. For too many years, too many people have been raising their voice, uh, saying what has happened to them, and people have not been listening. The inquiry is at pains to point out that this latest friction is not about its scope, but about the conduct of its chief lawyer. However, yet again, the central issue remains as to just what this multi-million pound independent inquiry is supposed to be about and whether it can really deliver justice to so many victims and so many survivors going back so many years. Channel 4 News understands that the current chair, Did Professor everybody? Alexis J, is nearing the end of a review that will determine the future of this beleaguered inquiry. Simon Israel and victims whose cases are being investigated by the independent inquiry into sexual abuse faced another blow today. With more on that, Ed Hauker is with me. He's been looking into the events at the Knollview Residential School in Rochdale for some time. Ed. Well, so I've spoken to pupils from the Knollview Residential School today and they're incredibly angry because Greater Manchester Police have decided to end their investigation looking into abuse allegations at the school. You may remember Knollview School was founded by Cyril Smith and allegations have swirled that pupils there were abused in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Well, tonight and today, the CPS and Greater Manchester Police will bring charges against just one uh, man. In the meantime, pupils feel incredibly upset about that and their only hope, really, is that the independent inquiry into sexual abuse will examine their uh, claims. That's the good news. But after today's news, I suppose it's the bad news as well. 
Cyril Smith looms large over Rochdale again tonight. After his death, Greater Manchester Police acknowledged the overwhelming evidence that the local MP had sexually and physically abused young boys and began investigating offences committed at Knoll View, a residential school for vulnerable boys that he was allowed to found. But the MP was not the only person alleged to have abused boys at the school. Internal council reports from the 1990s state that boys as young as eight were sexually active and that on one night another alleged abuser gained access to the school. The staff were not there and he abused boys on the premises. Phil Taylor, a health worker, filed the first report, alarmed that boys were prostituting themselves in the town centre. People were coming away from as far away as Yorkshire, Sheffield. They knew about what was going on, abusing these boys and it was just continuing. It wasn't being stopped. Today, Greater Manchester Police said they were dropping their investigation into Norview after referring allegations involving 27 suspects to the CPS. They say there is insufficient evidence to prosecute all but one man. Other alleged abusers are dead. A social worker at Norview says the pupils were failed, first by the school and again by police. Martin Deegan says it's now up to them to find justice. If police inquiries can no longer continue wasting public money, then the individuals who've got cases with Slater and Gordon and other people, uh, 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 solicitors in Manchester and thereabouts, might now be able to take their cases to the High Court and be heard, and then this documentation will come out, and then the truth will come out, and then they, maybe, just maybe, there'll be some justice for, for the lads that are still alive, because we don't, remember, a number are dead. Well, we're joined now from Edinburgh by Ian McFadden. He suffered abuse whilst a student at Caldicott School in Buckinghamshire and is a participant in this inquiry. And Labour MP Chukramuna, a member of the Home Affairs Select Committee, who is also standing to be the committee's next chair. Uh, Ian McFadden, what's your reaction to what's happened today? It must feel like another hammer blow. Well, John, I'm personally, I'm, I'm really very angry. Um, I hear people who supposedly advocate for survivors saying that this is a hiccup. This, this is not a hiccup. This is, this is a meltdown um, and it's wholly unacceptable. Yeah, you know, the, the inquiry may well be putting out press releases that, that, that they're not in crisis, but I can assure you with the survivors that I've spoken to, they're in crisis with what's going on today. Well, now, has your contact with this committee made any sense? Have you felt that it had a potential to deliver? Well, I, I'm, I'm awaiting for my strand uh, within, within the inquiry to, to be put forward so I can apply for core participant status. Um, but, uh, you know, at this rate, the way we're going forward, I may well be drawing my pension quicker than I actually get uh, core participant status. Your very use of the phrase, I'm waiting for the strand, suggests it's an immensely complicated process even to line up what they're going to do. <laughs> It may well be, John, but we, none of this is rocket science. If we look towards Australia, um, Australia ha has an inquiry which is being regarded as really highly successful, and it's as complex and complicated as our inquiry. Um, you know, if, if it needs to be broken down into smaller pieces, so be it, but the terms of references currently are non-negotiable. Well, Chukaramuna, that's really where you come in, because your committee is going to question the new chair of the Committee of Inquiry. Um, and I'm wondering, do, do you feel the whole thing needs reconfiguring or what? I think there does need to be some reconfiguring. My principal interest in this is actually that many of the survivors from the Shirley Oates survivors group in your package are constituents of mine. So I've been following this now for the last couple of years. But for the inquiry to say, well, look, there isn't a crisis, it's not credible to suggest that this is a properly functioning inquiry. It's dysfunctional. When you lose three chairs, you're now on to your fourth. You lose your lead counsel. Well, he has been suspended. He was told he was suspended through learning of it by the internet. It doesn't seem he was told. You lose the second most senior lawyer, Elizabeth Prochaska, as well. It might not be a crisis, but it's incredibly dysfunctional. And I think that these short statements we've seen on the inquiry's website are not enough. 
Um, Alexis Jay, the professor who is leading the inquiry, she is due to be giving evidence to the Home Affairs Select Committee in the middle of October. But frankly, I think we need a much fuller statement from her as to what is going to happen with the lead counsel of the inquiry. Obviously, they're investigating that, but how long is he going to be suspended for? How does it affect the inquiry's work? Will the second lead counsel, Elizabeth Prochaska, who, by the way, actually it appears resigned effective from the 15th of September, we've only just learnt about it now, is somebody going to replace her? And then in terms of the overall structure, one of the things that Professor Jay's predecessor, Lou Goddard, referred to was just the sheer, the sheer size of it. And I think this is one of the reasons why perhaps a proper federal structure for the inquiry needs to be instituted, where we currently have 13 different investigations which are the subjects of the inquiry. Well, why not turn those into 13 mini inquiries with a proper named head who can lead for that part of the country that it refers to? So, for example, the one that's dealing with Lambeth, you could have a head of the inquiry for Lambeth, and then Professor Jay could lead coming up with the overall national recommendations and conclusions of the inquiry. That might m help it make it a bit more manageable, and perhaps that's what she's looking into in her review. But do you sense that these resignations and the suspension may be exactly about that, about how they go forward, how they structure going forward? And uh, do you have a view on whether, for example, Mr Emerson should indeed be desuspended? Well, I, I th I'm not sure it would be appropriate for me to, contact, uh, to comment on that without knowing exactly why he has been suspended. They deny, by the way, John, that the reason that he has left, well, he hasn't left, of course, the reason he's been suspended is because he disagrees with the whole way that the inquiry is being run. Um, but, I mean, this investigation needs to happen very quickly. I mean, of course, for him, he is a deputy high court judge. If he's not seen as being fit conducting the inquiry, then for him personally, that has implications, which is why he has instructed lawyers to no. act on his behalf, it would seem, in respect of his suspension. Well, Ian McFadden, what does it feel like as a survivor um, simply to have this extraordinary swirl going on at the top and really absolutely nothing changing your life in the bottom? Can I be wholly honest with you, John? I, I've been dealing with this inquiry um, for the last two and a half years. It, it has consumed my life. There are a few people who I have met along the way. Ben Emerson is one of them. Um, he is a man who has all the skill set to be doing the job that he's been employed to do. Um, people ask me, is this, is this the establishment trying to undermine um, the credibility or, or the ability for this inquiry to step forward? Two years ago, I would have said that they were conspiracy theorists who came up with this. Now, I'm beginning to doubt. You know, at, at what stage is this an independent inquiry? As far as I can understand, the secretariat and the head of the secretariat were, were ex um, ex civil servants from the Home Office. They were, one of them was an employee for, from Theresa May's office. You know, at what what stage are we going to have an inquiry that's fit for survivor's purpose and that isn't going to keep re-traumatising people who were terribly abused in their childhood? Ian McFadden, thank you very much indeed, and I'm sorry to put you through that, but thank you very much. And Tukar Muna, thank you very much indeed. We'll look to see what your committee comes up with next week. John is in Surbiton. John, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Listen, hey. I'm, I'm, listen I'm really glad you're, uh, you're picking this up today. Um, where can I start? Right. I, two weeks ago, um, I was at an inquiry. Sorry, not an inquiry. I was at a um, press conference. And this press conference was in relation to uh, whistleblowers um, that worked in the social services. So that, if you like, police, uh, uh, social workers, yes. house uncles, house aunties. Um, and what's happened is uh, myself... So six other, 600 other children um, lived in a place called Shirley Oaks. Um, there was a lot of abuse there. I'll, I'll call it ritual abuse. Um, to very prominent people. Um, and what's happened is we were at this... Uh, yeah, you, you were in the care of Lambeth Council. Yeah, that's it, yeah. I was in the care of Lambeth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was in the care of Lambeth. And... At this uh, press conference, as I said, some very prominent um, people came forward and spoke about um, reporting things, reporting things that they'd seen or things that they'd been investigating. Um, and there was a few people there. There was one guy in particular, um, 
I won't go into too many details, but this chap uh, told us that he was investigating someone quite prominent. Um, and he was told in no uncertain terms, do you go any further with this? Um, this is back in the day, so to speak, when this person worked in, the, in, in one of the homes. Yeah, sorry, what we're talking about here, so if, I, if I could put a, uh, a, a time span on this, we're sort of talking about around about uh, 19, from about 1975 to about 1983. The, so the, 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 the Shirley Oaks survivors, I mean, are covering an even bigger area, aren't they? They're looking for anyone to come and talk to them between 1950 and 2003 who was abused in the in the care of, of Lambeth, but but your window is smaller than that, clearly. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, yeah. The socio um, group are looking for a, a much wider thing, but yeah. the, the problem, the, the, the worst things that happened were around about 1970 to 1983. That's when a lot of key people, um, uh, you know, a lot of a key paedophiles were um, <clears throat> came to Shirley, did a lot of bad things, um, and seemed to move on to, to higher positions within the social services. Um, this, when you say ritual, you kind of mean institutional, right? As, as, rather than ritual, there wasn't there wasn't a sort of satanic element to, to what went on. It was just the fact that these people well, were acting in concert together. They, they were they, they they weren't acting alone. Well, look, how Okay, all right. Yeah, they were, they were, okay, so we're talking about um, we're talking about a paedophilic ring. Yeah. We're also talking about um, uh, school teachers, superintendents yes. uh, meeting um, in lodges, in houses, with um, uh, particular children, children from seven to thirteen year olds, um, and doing things to them. So yes. if you don't call that a ritual, um, what would you call it? No, I know, I know. It's, I, 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 it's just rit ritual con conjures up the, the the notion of of some sort of satanic element, but but I, that, I, I'd call it institutional rather than ritual. But but it's it's just a I'm just for for, for the sake of history rather than okay. pedantry. Well, there, there, seem, there seems to be there seems to be a link between um, for me there seems to be a link between professional people or people in professional positions and young children, and this exactly. link has been going on for some two hundred years. Uh, now the first, you know, the first recorded case of child abuse um, uh, was with a young girl, and I haven't got her name to hand. You know, this was some some two hundred years ago. Well, it wouldn't even have been a crime then. The, the Victorian era had loads of child brothels, um, uh, sort of dotted mostly around the South Bank in London. But but let, let's steer back to now. Well, no, no, there, there was a, no, no, no. There, there was a, a, an institute set up from uh from that point <clears throat> so it's something like 1875 or 1879 I, 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 exactly but we're, we're looking at the inquiry which i mean it's got a broad remit but it doesn't have a remit as as, as big as that okay, and, right. and well, the, the question of faith in this new inquiry. inquiry yeah all right well let's look at the inquiry very simply over the last i don't know how many years three or four years we've had various different chairs uh the most recent chair uh, is Alexi J. um now we've had uh, Mr. Emerson resign. Um, he hasn't resigned. He's been suspended what? after rumours that he might resign. What was the, What was the, Give me the main points you rang well, in to make, John. Well, my main points are, are this. You, you say, uh, is there any, uh, any conspiracy uh, links? Yeah. I say that there is. And I say that all these chairs, they seem to investigate. They, they, you know, they, they go down the rabbit hole uh, and they all seem to hit a brick wall. And they, whatever they find, for some reason they resign... Uh, or for some reason they're, they're, they're suspended. Or I mean, it, it does seem a little bit strange. We've had this is the fourth chair. It now does seem strange, in doesn't the space it? Space of two years. So and and to refer back to Shirley Oaks, because a lot of people won't be as across these issues as you are. Okay. But this okay. is part so of the reason why people have. This, now hang on a minute. This is part of the reason people have got a problem with Alexis J. Is that she used to be a social worker, and it's the involvement of social workers in the Shirley Oaks cases in particular that leads some of Absolutely. the survivors to question whether even she, number four, is a suitable person to be chairing this inquiry. Absolutely. Two years ago, we predicted that this this cumbering giant would just falter on and fail, and we think it's by design. We're, you know, people have got to start waking up. There are things we discovered about the uh, the um, involvement of some of those government um, organisations that are part of this inquiry that is it, too sensitive for them to allow to come out. And so, when you appoint a person, you appoint the right person. Three appointments. They're the wrong people, clearly, because they're not there. And if they're saying Ben's personality is in question or his temperament, 
they would have known that way before. So people really have to start and, and, and think about what it is that's underneath the carpet. And we've discovered it in our investigation. We know exactly what it is. We know why they do not want this to, to come out. And Ben is just another casualty of this, this failed inquiry, which was set, set up to fail from, right. from the, the I, beginning. I, what you're suggesting, it is deliberately being sabotaged by the government. I'm saying that absolutely. And I can give you clear evidence. Who? Was, Who within or where within the government is there, are there attempts well, to sabotage? You, you don't want me to name the names, clearly. What? So I'll tell you where. The Home Office is liable for what took place in those children's homes. We have asked for clarification on the Home Office's liability. Chakra Muna has asked for clarification. And they said to Chakra Muna, it's too far back. We've asked for it again. Very simple question. If you are the sponsor of this inquiry, tell us your liability before we go head on into this investigation. We need to know whether there's a conflict of interest. We're doing this knowing exactly what their liability is, knowing what home officers, officers were in control at particular times okay. when the investigations were taking place in Lambeth. So it is very serious. And it's not for people to deal with this as a frivolous exercise. There and so in your experience, were you entirely happy with the way Ben Emerson was, it, his involvement in the way he was handling I'm things? Not, I'm not entirely happy with anyone. And my job is not to be happy with anyone. My job is to see if they can do an efficient, efficient work on behalf of the many victims around the country. So I have no question that Ben Emerson had the experience to be able to drive this. Whether his personality was a bit rough at the edges, well, I, I'm sure that was his trademark. Did some, they must have known exactly who he was and the type of person he was. The same as Justice Goddard. Someone must have known that she wouldn't want to hang around for an in investigation that was supposed to last four years is now predicted to last 15 years. So now, we have to really look at the nuances of what's going on here. Just one thing. You have um, been reported as not being satisfied with Professor Alexis J running, ch chairing the uh, inquiry because she is a social worker. Is that true? Absolutely true. Because you just don't trust all social workers? You know what, that's, just to put it like that is a bit too simplistic. I'll give you the, the theory. We were brought up in children's homes and the judge and jury were social workers. In our case in Lambeth, it was infected by paedophiles. In our case, social workers were sending people away to remand centres to keep them quiet. So just the idea of asking us to go through some kind of Groundhog Day and come back and, you know, it's, it's as if we're kids again and sit there in front of a social worker. And also, remember, we made it very clear so, at the inquiry. So we, can I ask, have you, have you pulled out, because I know you've been threatening to pull out of this inquiry, are you not going to be involved? We're not in the inquiry until they can clarify certain issues. Right. The issues on, on the new chair are fundamental to our members who were let down by social services. And again... And that's because she's a social worker? It's because she's come from the same industry that failed us, absolutely. Raymond Stevens thank Stevenson, you thank you very much. Bye-bye. I'm in the link there. Look, look, I mean, you've got house uncles, so if you like, you've got these dormitories, you've got people living in dormitories, and you have people called house uncles and have house aunties. Now, these people have to be suitable people, yeah. have to go through uh, certain checks. So if you like... If I'm a boss, let's say I'm an area manager or a social worker, uh, I employ a house uncle. That house uncle has to be suitable, has to be suitable to look after young children. Right? So as a social worker, there are checks and balances that you're supposed to do. So how, how did these paedophiles get through? How did they become house uncles yeah. or teachers? So what we have to say is, if the social services... Uh, uh, a social worker is now um, chairing the, uh, the process, but at the same time, um, say, 20 or 30 years ago, was a social worker themselves. So I'm not saying that there's any... No, any but there's, there's room for go. questions, and on something like this, there shouldn't be. Exactly. And, and so, and, and as I said, going back, if we went back to um, the Goddard uh, and, and previous people to Goddard, there, there, there seems to be a problem. They seem to get... They seem to, if you like, get six, seven months in. They seem to uncover things, and then they sort of say to themselves, "Well, that's it." I'm but, which doesn't mean they're corrupt. It could just mean they're completely cowed by the scale of what 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 they see before them. Can I ask whether you have faith in Ben Emerson? Because I know that most survivors do, John. 
I do. Yeah, absolutely. So he, he could absolutely. he be could he be described as, as as the only sort of senior person involved, and the only one with the relevant experience in whom the survivors retain faith, and he's now been suspended. Exactly. Oh, and man. that's what makes this look and this and that's what makes this look very 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 suspicious. You know, when I, when I heard this news yesterday, there's two things that happened. One, I felt gutted. Yes, of course. Um, and I thought, well, this is you know the whole thing's happening all over again. Uh, and like you said, you, you raised the point, there's the trust element and God knows what else. Um, and then two, I thought, well, this guy's been there from sort of day one, if you like. Now he's gone, anything can happen. And that, that, is, that, that, anything can happen. that is the fear. That really is the fear. And, and I, I mean, I appreciate that's a slightly longer amount of time than a caller ordinarily gets on the programme. But I'm sure everybody listening understands why, John, of course linked to the abuse um, uh, as, as, a, as a survivor, as a victim at the Shirley um, Oaks Children's Home in Croydon, where in 1977 a boy died in circumstances that many believe were suspicious. He was found hanged there, and uh, it is believed by other survivors of the abuse that took place there that he may not have killed himself. So we'll go to the headlines now, then we'll come back. But but do you see why we're having this conversation? It's, it's, it's not a question of coming up with the answers or the solutions or achieving justice. It's just that if we don't, who will? And it's just a strange hour together today for which I, 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 I'd make no apology and, uh, and expect no praise. It just has to be had, this conversation, however sticky it may be. This child sex abuse inquiry is not going to deliver justice, is it? It's falling apart at the seams. It's on to its fourth chair, a chair whose past as a social worker means some survivors of abuse by social workers don't have enormous faith in her, rightly or wrongly. That's their position. They're entitled to it. And despite this long list of independent inquiries, this long list of investigations, they haven't had any evidence yet, and the likelihood of... of well, I'm hearing from some of my contacts in this field, and they're telling me how this made their feeling. And the possibility that the light at the end of the tunnel that seemed to have been ignited when Theresa May called this inquiry in July 2014 is, is dimming even further today. So I guess I'm just asking whether you actually now think this is one of those hardy perennials of conspiracy theories that, that is true, that, rare, that rarest of creatures, that unicorn of stories, where, yeah, there was massive VIP sex abuse done on an industrial scale and it involved people so high up MPs, police officers so high up that there's no way the truth was ever going to come out, which some of you said to me all along and I, I was a little optimistic, perhaps a little naive, and I still want to be Ben's in Clacton on Sea, I'll talk to him but remember if you want to join this conversation from any angle at all, the number you need is 0345 973 Ben, what would you like to say? Thanks for taking my call, James You're welcome um, the the um, the Ellen House was uh, was first came to notice when I was looking at the internet uh, and the story behind that and Cyril Smith's involvement in that area and the police inquiry was shut down and the allegation was at the time that MI5 and MI6 had got involved. It was, spe it was special branch. I, I spoke to the journalist. It's, is it Don Hale who was responsible for, for overturning the miscarriage of justice with regard to, to the so-called Bakewell Tart case? And, and he, he, he told us that special branch turned up at his, or people claiming to be special branch, turned up at his office and removed material that I think he'd been given by Barbara Castle. Uh, the late cabinet minister that that did indeed refer to Cyril Smith and and to others and and the, you know normally you'd you'd smell a rat if someone said stuff like that you'd think yeah all right keep taking the tablets but there's too much of it Ben there's too many people telling too many similar tales. Well, the inquiry itself, I, I, <laughs> you get conspiracy theories and and most of them are untrue. Of course. But but uh, this particular one has got so many so many legs to it that. <laughs> So what, what, I mean, that, the problem then becomes, what was Theresa May playing at? Did she not realise what, what, what she was doing, or, or is she part of, the, part of the problem? I think it's a possibility that she's part of the problem, because uh, when she was Home Secretary, there was evidence lost that should have went to the inquiry, and it actually disappeared. Uh, it was in the newspaper report last year. That evidence for the inquiry had actually been lost. And uh, there's too much evidence actually <laughs> convenient of being lost. Jeffrey Dickens... Dossier. Uh, as, as, yeah. Which he gave to Leon Britton. And then when Leon Britton died, all the newspaper coverage was about how awful it was that his house had been searched while his, while his now widow was 
was present. None of it was about what the hell happened to that dossier that Jeffrey Dickens put together, showing alleged abuse by very, very senior politicians. And I think the inquiry itself should start at the very top and work its way down. Uh, the, the chairman that, that resigned saying that it was too big an inquiry and yes. all that, maybe that's deliberate. Um, so that uh, whoever... But then why bother doing it at all? That's the bit I don't understand. Is is why, why not just carry on sweeping stuff under the carpet? Why give hope to the survivors? Why give uh, encouragement to the investigators? I think it's because it would bring down government. Um, no, but that's a reason not to do it. Not a reason to yeah. do it. Well, they do it and then they, they look good and then they end up putting obstacles in the way of the inquiry itself and they, they'll, they'll make it as big as they can so that when they eventually get to the really guilty people at the, at the top end of society, um, it will be too late or most of them will be dead. I mean, that's, and uh, there's no evidence, so therefore they, I mean, this is, Elm House was, I mean, one of your presenters a couple of years ago I spoke to, who's now left LBC, um, said to me that, um, when the police arrived at Elm House, there was lots of children actually there. Well, I don't. I, I mean, we, I don't think we need actually to move into the realms of, of stuff we can't say with confidence to each other. We can concentrate entirely on stuff we can say with confidence, or stuff that you know, respected sources like Don Hale, the, the, the former editor of that paper in Derbyshire, and various other people have told us as well. And the amount of damage done by Nick and uh, via Exaro News, who we were absolutely, absolutely persuaded by and supportive of, just like the Metropolitan Police were, can't be underestimated. You, you, you begin to wonder then whether even that may have been a red herring that was being deliberately waved under people's noses, noses like mine. You really do. Nothing is sacred, nothing is certain when you find yourself in territory like this. And that's why the fact that it keeps falling apart like this, it keeps falling apart, it just doesn't seem to me to be a coincidence. I'm sorry, I'm usually the bloke who insists on rationality. But I, there's too much, isn't there? 0345, Ben, thank you. 0345 6060973 is the number you need. Uh, let's go to June, who's in Orpington. June, what do you think? Morning. I don't think we will ever get a full inquiry, not because there are so many people in high office who have been abusers, but because there are so many people in high office who think they might know somebody yeah. who is an abuser. And they might be their mentor or their hero or, or, or just a to, former colleague. To expose somebody that you know not only leaves you feeling wretched for having exposed them, but it's the same as why most family members never believe that one of their own has done it, yeah. why a lot of abusers aren't believed by their own family. To admit that somebody you know has done that and to admit that you should have or might have had any kind of inkling cause yeah. your own self into See, I can't believe, for example, that the headmaster at my prep school didn't know what was going on. I just can't believe it. I haven't been able to say that um, before because he was still alive, but he isn't now. So I just can't because we all knew. Every single boy knew. Uh, but why couldn't you say it while he was still alive? Because it would be libelous. No, for you to say, I have always had a suspicion deep in my own heart that might... Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, was, it, was, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't important enough because the case was in court and the man is now, the, the, the culprit is now in prison. But just in examining what people who you think could perhaps have called time on it sooner and didn't, the reason would be partly self-interest, self-protection, but also what you describe as, as just not wanting it to be true. Just, just desperately hoping that if you close your eyes and start your fingers in your ears, it would all go away, which must be what mums do when their daughters come to them and tell them what their stepdad has done. They just don't want it to be true. So yeah. suddenly yeah, it isn't. Well, I'm not listening syndrome. Y yes, it, yes. It is. It calls too much about your own self into question to unmask somebody who you should have known. I, with, think, I, I, with I think you're right. And th th there's the cultural thing as well. There's a, there's a, I mean, a very troubling piece written by a great friend of mine, actually, in the, in the Spectator magazine a few years ago about abuse committed by the Christian brothers at his school. And he, he is adamant that it didn't have any detri particularly detrimental effect on him at all when, when a priest put his hand down his trousers on, on, on several occasions. But the, the boys giggled about it. It didn't have the impact that it has today so it, it, it doesn't make all of these people who look the other way complicit it just makes them creatures of their times rather than our times yeah and it impacts on people even people who weren't abused your attitude towards abuse 
your attitude towards victims and perpetrators is influenced by the fact that you knew a victim. You were yes. in an environment where it happened, even several. though it didn't touch you. Yes. But, but then that's, that's I mean, that, I could have reacted in the opposite way. The teacher could have been my hero, you know, and, and then I'd be part of the people going, no, don't be ridiculous, not, not Mr. O'Brien, which coincidentally enough was his name. But it would have still have impacted on you. Yes. It didn't. Happen. Yeah, and, and that's what you take away from these things. So in terms of trying to extrapolate from the individual case, like I have experience of at my school, through to the institutional, which is what these investigations are designed to address, you can see how at almost every turn, people would be reluctant to, to come forward with everything they suspected at the time, because automatically it puts the question mark above their head, well, why didn't you come forward at the time? You know, if you, if you, were, if you were at my prep school in Worcestershire in the early 1980s, and you were a teacher, and you knew what Jonathan O'Brien was doing to my friends in the dark room, you're not going to come out now and say, yeah, I did actually, because you were a responsible adult then and you didn't help them even if you didn't know even if you just suspected you knew what the gossip was do you know the headmaster one night he, i remember we were we were in the showers washing in the showers and he had a sort of carpentry workshop behind a door at the bottom of of, of the cellar that wasn't suspect that was just the layout of the buildings mm -hmm. and we were talking about him and we'd i'd gone to some stupid scottish dancing class because i thought it would be a good way of earning brownie points with the headmaster so i said uh, oh and i yeah and i've been to the scottish dancing class because i reckon i'll get brownie points off the headmaster and the door opens and he's standing there with his with his saw and his drill or whatever doing his carpentry and he goes oh no you won't o'brien and we all thought that was absolutely hilarious but it shows that he eavesdropped on us and we talked often about what was going on in the dark room <laughs> and, so he, he, yeah. and that's why because if, if that man was contacted by the police after my other teacher was arrested and they said did you know anything what's he going to say he's going to say no i knew nothing i knew nothing at all i didn't even have the vaguest suspicion because if he said yes we did we all knew we all had suspicions just like every single boy in the school did that's why i don't think the truth is going to come out it doesn't make people complicit it doesn't make them corrupt just makes them human. Perhaps I'm being too charitable.